So after the overwhelmingly positive critical reception of Metal Gear Ghost Babble for the Game Boy, Konami decided it would be a good idea to let the game's director, Shinta Nojiri, take the helm on a new handheld spin-off for the series. And this was a very exciting time for handheld gaming, with Sony's new PlayStation Portable being just on the horizon, and thanks to Konami's strong relationship with the PlayStation brand, this new Metal Gear spin-off would end up being a launch title for the PSP. So the team sat down to decide what this new title would be, and they of course chose the most natural fit for the Metal Gear franchise. A card-based tactical RPG. What? So, did Metal Gear Acid manage to stick this bold landing, or did they stray too far away from what the Metal Gear franchise is supposed to be? Well, let's talk about it. And before getting too far into the video, I should mention that this is the ninth in a series of videos where I'm playing every Metal Gear game for the first time and reviewing them as I go along in preparation for Metal Gear Delta. And while you don't have to have seen the rest of the videos in order to enjoy this one, you will be missing a lot of important context about my journey with the series if you haven't seen them, so I'll have the full playlist linked in the description below for those of you that want to go check those out first. But with that out of the way, Metal Gear Acid is a turn-based collectible card tactical RPG game, say that five times fast, developed and published by Konami for the PlayStation Portable in 2004. And yeah, a card-based strategy game isn't what I or most people would expect from the Metal Gear series, and while strategy games aren't typically my thing, I have gotten really into a couple of them throughout the years, especially that one time I developed a crippling addiction to XCOM, so I went in with an open mind here. Starting up the game though, we start with a new character Teleco running around in a building, showcasing what the gameplay can look like for us and fighting off some guards as she does. Eventually, she reaches a storehouse and is captured by a man known as Leon, who tells his men to make sure that Clown doesn't find her. We then cut to series protagonist Solid Snake, who is a bit of a question mark in this game. See, Metal Gear Acid is a non-canon entry that takes place in its own continuity, much like Ghost Babble, but unlike Ghost Babble, it's not clear if any of the events of the canon Metal Gear games actually took place in this timeline. In Ghost Babble, it's made very clear that the events of the original Metal Gear's Outer Heaven incident occurred in that timeline, but here in Acid, we're told that Snake is considered a legendary soldier, much like in the mainline entries, but we don't get any information beyond that. There are a couple names or references thrown around that seem to hint at the possibility that some of those games may have occurred, but nothing concrete, so honestly, I'm just going to assume that none of them did. Anyway, Snake gets a call from a man named Roger, an old friend of Roy Campbell's, who is in charge of this mission. He tells us that the SWAT HRT, or Hostage Rescue and Tactics Unit that was sent in before us, was wiped out by the enemy, and that they believe said enemy is looking for a research project called Pythagoras. Snake asks for details, with Roger responding that we don't really have any, but that the lead researcher, Dr. Fleming, might be able to shed some light on it if we manage to get into contact with him. And here, Roger also gives us a basic rundown of the game's core mechanics and systems. Firstly, we learn how to move, using either a card that is specifically made for movement which will always take you further distances in less time, or just using any other generic card in your deck that can be burned for a small amount of movement. We also get taught about equipment cards, which are cards that aren't used immediately, but rather are stored in your inventory until something triggers their use. And of course, the weapon cards, allowing us to deal damage to targets, which come in both use type, meaning they are immediately used to deal damage, or the equip type, meaning that they're stored in the inventory for later use. After this though, we get a strange cutaway where two dolls have hijacked a plane, chemically paralyzing all passengers on board. One of the dolls calls into the control tower on the ground, telling them that they've taken all the passengers hostage, and that they've planted a bomb on the plane that will detonate if the altitude falls below 35,000 feet. They then demand that the treasure known as Pythagoras from the Libido Physics and Chemistry Lab in Southern Africa be delivered to them with no strings attached within 10 hours. And just before signing off, the doll also mentions that they've confirmed that a senator named Vigo Hatch, who just so happens to be running for president as well, happens to be one of the passengers on this flight. We then cut to a man named Charles, who says that this is a perfect opportunity and that they need to strike while the iron is hot. We then go back to Snake infiltrating the facility, with Roger telling us that he'd like us to meet Alice Hazel, a very gifted psychic who is working with intelligence on this mission. 
And immediately, I take notice of the fact that Alice is holding a doll in her character portrait. So we get introduced to two seemingly supernatural dolls hijacking a plane, and just two minutes later, we're introduced to a gifted psychic who clearly has a certain appreciation for dolls. Right. From here, we get our first proper level, and with that, our first real look at how the gameplay actually works. To put it as simply as possible, Metal Gear Acid has you doing all the things you would expect to do in a Metal Gear game from sneaking to silently taking guards out, to getting into a massive gunfight or running away to hide when spotted, but all of this is done through the game's new card system. Every time you play a card, you're going to accumulate a certain amount of cost with each action, with how much cost you gain being dictated by the card you play. Cost seems complicated at first, but it's simply the time system that the game uses to dictate when each character on the board is able to move or take action again. And what's interesting about this is that it ditches the traditional turn-based structure where every character just goes in a set order, and instead it adds a whole new level of strategy and awareness to the combat. So say that there's Snake and two guards on the board. Snake has six cost, one guard has two, and one has seven. The guard with 2 cost will end up going first, and once he does, Snake's cost will go down to 0 and the other guards down to 5 due to the passage of time and things keep rolling on from there. There are also cards that you can earn that can be played to reduce your cost, meaning that there's a whole layer of tactics based around just trying to squeeze more actions out of less time in order to gain the upper hand on your enemies, and it's honestly a really cool system once you get used to it. And after sneaking through this first area, we get a call from a man named Gary Murray, an engineer from the lab who grabbed a codec from a dead SWAT member. He explains that he was in charge of the quarantine and disease prevention for the test animals in the facility, but that he doesn't really know what they were researching as it was all kept so secretive. He says that he's in the command room to the north of the lab, and he tries to tell us where Dr. Fleming is, but his radio is broken so we don't quite make it out. I like how this sets up some intrigue with us not really knowing whether or not we can trust Gary, as many things about what he says seem fishy, like not knowing what they were researching despite being a quarantine and prevention specialist, or the fact that his codec conveniently breaks right when we ask about Dr. Fleming's whereabouts. Regardless, it's all that we have to go on at this point, so we set off to find Gary. We then cut back to the plane, where the two dolls tell Senator Hatch that they've killed the pilot and co-pilot and carved messages into their bodies, with him being reasonably confused at the fact that dolls are even speaking to him. Also after this first mission, we gain access to the deck editor, as most players will have discovered the card packs that were spread throughout the first mission. The developers have laid these card packs all over the levels in this game to encourage you to take your time and explore, and be rewarded with new card packs to open as a result of your extra effort. Your deck has a maximum of 30 cards at this point in the game, though as you progress, this will increase up to 40 by the time that you complete the game, and we'll come back to it in a bit, but the deck building aspect of this game can actually be really interesting. Continuing forward, intelligence eventually deduces that the soldiers who have taken control of the facility are part of the Leone unit, a group of mercenaries operating within Maloney. And as I was sneaking around the Leone soldiers in these early levels, I realized more and more that the way that stealth has been integrated into the turn-based system is actually really cool. It's about what you would expect from any generic stealth system, with players needing to stay out of the guard's line of sight, not do anything too loud like throwing a grenade, don't set off any security systems, etc. But now, it's once again all done through this turn-based system, so it completely changes the way that everything feels. If a guard sees you, they're of course going to need to call for backup, so they'll run away and radio for help. But by doing this, they've used a couple of cards from their deck and built up some cost from doing so, so you have a small window of time to use whatever cards are currently in your hand to take the guard out before they can raise the alert. The only weird thing with stealth in this game is that unsuppressed weapons actually don't attract the attention of other guards, so if you want to drop a guard silently with, say, a FAMAS, you can do so without any other guards near you hearing a thing. We eventually find Gary, who tells us that Dr. Fleming was taken to the residential quarters by the Leone unit. He then tells us about a research building here in the facility called FAR, explaining that only the doctor and his closest associates ever had access to the place and that it's where most of the actual research took place. We tell him to stay put while we make our way to the residential quarters to find Fleming. 
We get a cutaway back to Senator Hatch on the plane, with him telling the woman he's with, Lena, to get into contact with the White House and explain the situation to them the best she can. At this point in the game, we also get introduced to the card shop. At the end of every mission in the game, you'll be scored based on your performance, including bonuses for things like finishing the level quickly, not killing any enemies, or never being spotted. With the points that you score by completing missions, you can go to the card shop and purchase themed card packs based on previous games in the series, and even just previous Kojima works in general, with there even being cards from games like Snatcher and Police Knots present here. Every pack you buy will give you three random cards from that set, with there of course being some cards that are very, very rare. The card shop really makes it feel like you're buying and opening packs of trading cards, especially if you've played the previous games the packs are based on, and I really love how charming the whole thing is. And between this and the collectible card packs you can find in the levels, the progression in this game feels pretty great since you'll constantly be unlocking new possibilities for your deck. And as I alluded to earlier, the deck building in this game is actually pretty damn good. There are over 200 unique cards in the game to collect, and with a maximum of 40 in a deck, you'll have to make some choices about what you do and don't want to take along with you in missions. And even though you can carry up to 40, you might not always want to carry that many, as if you want to be able to use certain cards more frequently, having a larger deck will only inflate your deck and make it take longer to draw those cards. I put together a lot of different decks throughout my playthrough just playing around with the systems and seeing what you could do, and it was definitely really satisfying to have a deck finally come together and feel good. The only issue here in my opinion is that with over 200 unique cards available, a good amount of them are basically useless unless you're doing something incredibly specific, and even then, they might not even be the best option available. But this is almost inevitable in a game with so many different options, so take that as you will I guess. Moving forward though, we get more details from Intelligence, with them finding out that Fleming was conducting drug-related experiments at the lab. Roger explains to us that test subjects were brought in from various countries to be injected with a number of viruses in order to test the drugs, being forced into signing their lives away before being allowed to participate, likely being offered very large sums of money to trick them into signing for it, with Snake realizing that that must be the reason they chose a remote island as the location for this lab. We then cut back to the plane again, with Lena asking the girl sitting behind her what her name is, and her introducing herself as Minette Donald. Senator Hatch then manages to get his earpiece in, getting into contact with someone at the White House, who informs him about the bomb on the plane. He then asks if they can really trust Emilio to come through for them on this one, which stuck out to me as a bit of an odd question, as no one in the story is named Emilio up to this point. He finds out that they have a clairvoyant on the team, and he has Alice use her gift to contact Minette, who is seemingly unaffected by the paralyzing effects of the drugs, asking her to help them find the bomb on the plane. I'm not really sure why Minette is unaffected by the drugs, maybe it's because she's younger? Honestly, it's probably better if I just don't think about it too much. And at about this point in the game, I started to realize that the camera can be a bit awkward at times. Players are given control over it, being able to adjust the camera angle in increments of 45 degrees, but since it's not full camera control and only a few preset angles, it means that there are some spots in the game where it's difficult to see what's going on regardless of how you try to angle the thing. Continuing with the search for Fleming though, Alice calls in to tell us that she had a premonition of a large gun being pressed to Snake's head before blowing it off. Snake continues with the mission anyway, eventually reaching the residential quarters with the security system scanning us in automatically as Hans Davis. We find the room that Fleming is being held in before Leon and his men ambush us. We talk with Leon for about a minute before he suddenly shoots Fleming, aiming his gun at us, and then a flashbang comes in out of nowhere, allowing us a moment to escape. Once outside, we meet Teleco, the woman from the opening of the game, who tells us that we need to escape with her through the north gate. We make our escape with her, getting to control both characters on the way out, before Roger reveals that the two of them have actually worked together in the past. She explains to us that the real Fleming was actually taken to another building deeper into the facility, before Snake starts to suspect that Gary sent us into this trap knowingly because he's one of Leon's men. Gary tells us that that's not the case, and Roger proposes that maybe the guards let him escape intentionally, knowing that he would lead us into this trap unknowingly. We cut back to the plane where Minette is looking for the bomb, with Alice hinting that she might have an idea of who's behind the hijacking. 
And from this point on, we play as Snake and Teleco together for the rest of the game. The two of them have completely separate card decks that you can use to give each of them different strengths and weaknesses, but they also have some strengths and weaknesses beyond just your deck. Snake has more health than Teleco, but Teleco can use three cards per turn rather than the two that Snake can use. However, Snake can also make use of the Action Plus card to increase his actions per turn up to four, while these cards are completely unusable by Teleco. So experimenting with how to build these two out and the tactics that you can develop by using the two of them together are really cool. And while I really wasn't expecting to control more than one character, especially since I was a few hours into the game at this point, I was very pleasantly surprised by this. As we continue on, we get a call from Roger saying that he found some info about Hans Davis before Gary cuts in giving us more details and saying that Snake might have had something to do with the experiments, hence why the machine identified him by retinal scan. He reveals that he was working at the lab to get his hands on something called Accua and that he doesn't care about Pythagoras at all, saying that it has something to do with a weapon called Metal Gear. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! He tells us that he already has the Accua data and that he's going to go to Fleming to get the codes to crack it before quickly signing off. Snake confronts Roger, asking if he knew anything about a Metal Gear being there, and he admits that they thought it was possible, but that they had no concrete proof to go off of. As we move forward, Alice calls us, asking if we know the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Teleco happens to know the story, one where over a hundred children disappeared from the town of Hamlin overnight, but she has no idea what that could have to do with Snake, with Alice simply saying nothing. Snake then gets a splitting headache and hears voices telling Hans to wake up. And at this point in the story, I was 100% convinced that Snake himself was a former test subject whose memory was wiped, and that his real identity in this continuity is Hans Davis. On our way to stop Gary though, we come across the first truly long level in this game. Some levels in this game are just ridiculously long, and this one right here where we had to find what room Fleming was in took me a little over two hours to complete. This wouldn't be the biggest deal, but you can't change your decks unless you're in the main menu, and you only go there after completing a mission or quitting out of one, and on this particular occasion, I had tried some things with my card decks that didn't quite work out as well as I had hoped, meaning that I got stuck using some pretty bad card decks for the entire two hour stretch. On top of that, you can't save during these missions, so if you happen to die during an attempt of one of these one to two hour missions, you'll have to start all the way back at the beginning, regardless of how much progress you made. This became a pretty big problem for me later on in the game, where there was one mission that was roughly an hour long that was incredibly difficult, and I would get roughly 30 to 40 minutes into the level every time before dying to some random softlock, and it took me over 3 hours to complete this level alone due to how long each attempt of it took me. Again, not a problem to have these super long levels, but without checkpoints that make it easy to dip in and out of the menus and save your progress, it becomes really, really problematic. Anyway, we finally get to the room where they're holding Fleming, with him greeting us as Hans, before turning around to reveal that he's actually Gary. Snake is shocked, asking if he's already killed Fleming, with Gary revealing that he's actually been Fleming the entire time. He tells Snake that his real name is Hans Davis, causing him to have a flashback to the two of them experimenting on children. He then reveals that he never actually stole the Accua data, as he was the original creator of it anyway, and that he was just putting on an act to fool Roger. He says that he doesn't know how or why we lost our memory, but that we really are Hans Davis, an executive for the Beagle Corporation and the head of this laboratory. He tells us that the Beagle Company is widely believed to be in the business of providing humanitarian aid to developing nations, but that in reality, it's a weapons manufacturing company who sells to whatever country is willing to pay. He reveals that the two of us developed Metal Gear together before Hans simply disappeared one day and asks what happened to us. He then mentions something about a group of people called the Name Knowers before also telling us that his daughter has been kidnapped and he needs our help. He explains that the individual who hijacked the flight the senator is on is number 16, the one child they experimented on who turned out to be successful, who now wants revenge on the two of them. He tells us to feign ignorance of this entire conversation and continue pretending to be Snake to stall the operation, assuring us that he has a way to fix all this. Teleco then suddenly appears in the vent behind us, shooting Fleming, causing him to drop Pythagoras and run away. 
She reveals that she was actually in there listening the entire time, and she's unsure of who to trust between us and Fleming. She demands that we give her the Pythagoras data, saying that now that we're suspects, she can't trust us to hold on to it. So we hand it to her, and with this we've secured our objective, so we go to make our escape from the island. And while I was wrong about Snake being a former test subject, I have to say that this twist is definitely more interesting than what I had expected it to be, with me just being completely caught off guard by how sinister it is to actually make Snake into the kind of man who abducts children and experiments on them in this timeline. We then cut back to Charles reporting into Roger, saying that he has an update for him. He and Alice explain to Roger that the numbers the hijackers of the plane have been carving into the dead passengers has been spelling out a numerical code this entire time that, when translated, spells out Snake. Charles then asks Roger why Snake was assigned to the mission, since that would be exactly what the hijacker wanted in the first place, with Roger being unable to respond. Charles tells him that if Snake does or says anything strange, to report it to him immediately before signing off. We move forward, encountering Leon in a storehouse, with him explaining to Snake that he used to be a US soldier just like us. He hints towards some event that caused him to hate the US, before we get a boss fight with him that's actually pretty interesting. Leon is impossible to damage head on, and his rifle does incredibly high amounts of damage when fired at you, so in order to win this fight, you need to use one of the characters to bait out his attention, while having the other character run around to his back to get damage in where he can't react to it. This would be an incredibly simple fight in a typical Metal Gear game, but thanks to Acid's turn-based nature, it becomes much deeper than it would otherwise be, and it's a really satisfying fight to execute successfully due to how much resource management and planning things out ahead of time is required to actually beat it. After dealing enough damage to him though, we're told that an exit from the storehouse just opened up, and that we're better off running away than trying to actually kill him. So, we do so, making our way out of the storehouse and towards the far building to try to catch up with Fleming. On the way there, we reach a drawbridge where Teleco suddenly tries to shoot us before running across and raising the bridge behind herself. Roger realizes that she isn't really Teleco, and when asked who she is, she says that her name is Swallowtail. We run back to the other side to lower the bridge again, and as we're getting to the operations booth, it suddenly explodes and we're ambushed by guards. We quickly deal with them, but with the bridge now completely blocked off, we need to find another way to reach the FAR facility and get Pythagoras back from the fake Teleco. And I have to say, this twist completely caught me off guard, as I was under the impression that we would be playing alongside Teleco for the entire rest of the game due to her being tied into the progression so deeply. While we're running around, we get a call from Roger saying that he's just gotten documents in from intelligence that refer to someone known as La Clown. Their identity is unknown, with no one ever even having seen their face, and they're a master assassin that Beagle hired to steal the Pythagoras data before anyone else could in order to cover up their involvement with the program. We eventually come to Ebro Tower, the building that Alice suspects Clown is hiding out in, and when we enter, we see two enemy soldiers wearing red and blue balaclavas shooting at one another. This shows us the level's gimmick, with soldiers in each area of the tower wearing different colors, and being ordered to shoot anyone who doesn't have the same color on. It's a bit of an awkward gimmick due to how the card system in this game works, but it's still really fun to run around in disguise nonetheless. And this is just part of a larger problem this game has when it comes to mandatory cards in certain levels. Not only do you have to make room in your deck for extra cards that wouldn't otherwise be there, but due to the nature of how the game works, drawing two cards from your deck per turn, sometimes you can get stuck somewhere in the level just discarding from your hand over and over again waiting to get the one card that you actually need to make progress again. It's not an issue that completely ruins the game, but it's pretty annoying when your progress is just brought to a screeching halt like that, and I can definitely see it getting progressively more and more annoying each time you replay the game as well. We eventually get to the elevator to go up to where Clown is, but as we're about to hop in, Snake gets another splitting headache before a duplicate of himself appears in front of him. Snake confronts the doppelganger, believing it to be Clown in disguise, but the second Snake claims that he's Hans Davis. Snake goes back and forth between believing him and not, while Hans explains that he is Snake's other half, the suppressed version of himself that he'd rather not let other people see. Snake calls Roger, asking if they can see anyone else in the room with him, with Roger saying that they can't, and that if there was someone in the room with him, they would obviously be able to see it on the monitor. 
Hans tells us that he has to get to the far building for an appointment with Fleming, and that he'll be seeing us around, quickly disappearing around the corner, leaving us with nothing to do but go up the elevator. And this scene is honestly really well executed, as I genuinely didn't know whether to think this was clown or not, with the question still lingering even after the scene had ended. When we get to the top of the elevator, we come to a room that's been set up like a giant board game. We realize that there are landmines all around us before Teleco appears at the highest point on the board. Snake calls out to her, and she asks how we know her name, confusing him, before saying that whoever wins this game gets to leave the room, and that she needs to get out of there. This leads to a pretty interesting boss fight with Teleco, where we need to defeat her while paying attention to what pieces of the board the two of us are standing on, as differently colored tiles on the board will boost certain attributes like defense or your hit rate. And while the Mind Detector card is a default unlock at the start of the game, I never had it in my deck as I figured that I would just toss it in whenever I needed it, so I also had to crawl around the board whenever moving to avoid getting my legs blown off just from running around. After beating Teleco, we take her out of the tower with us, before finding out that she doesn't have the Pythagoras data on her, meaning that she's actually the real Teleco this time. She tells us that Clown went to see Fleming in the far building before he activates Metal Gear, meaning that the Hans we saw earlier was in fact Clown in disguise. However, Snake starts to hear the voice of Hans in his own head, meaning that the whole thing about the part of Snake that he doesn't want people to know about might ring true after all. We cut back to Minette on the plane again, with her finally finding the bomb in the cargo hold, and Alice starts to walk her through the process to defuse it. As we move forward through the lab, we eventually see some unknown soldiers show up, shooting Leon's men on sight. We move through a full level of them, before we get a call from some unknown voice telling us to call him Buddy, saying that if we don't join up with Leon and his men, we'll be left to fight off the Accua soldiers all on our own. Continuing on, we come to a bridge where we find Leon, with him explaining that the Accua troops are drugged up zombified soldiers of Fleming's. We tell him that we're headed to the far building, with him saying that it's impossible for the two of us to get in on our own and that we're going to need his help if we want to. Snake is hesitant, but Roger allows him to team up with us, making us allies for the time being. And I might just be a sucker for this sort of thing, but I really loved how this game set up a bad guy from the start of the game, only to present a much worse bad guy later on, forcing us into becoming allies with the person we spent the first half of the game fighting. I don't know why, but I always just eat this shit up. We make a plan with him where we will go to the power plant and shut down the power to the far building's defenses, and when we do, Leon and his men will input the passcode and enter the building before the auxiliary power can come online. While he's waiting for us, Leon realizes that number 16 must be the one who called him to the island in the first place, and we put together that the radio call from earlier telling us to join with Leon must have also been number 16. But once we kill the power, Leon's men are suddenly ambushed by Accua troops, with none of them being spared. Fleming then walks out to the far building gate to confront Leon, revealing that he and number 16 have been working together this entire time. Fleming then hops onto our radio frequency, telling Roger to tell us about number 16's orders, before saying that the only reason his daughter was taken hostage was because of what Hans had forced him to create. Leon is captured by Fleming, and we lose contact with both of them. The next level has a fun gimmick with the power being out, affecting the visibility and making it impossible to see enemies that aren't within a few tiles of us. However, this is the 3 hour level that I mentioned earlier, as this gimmick turns it into one of the most difficult levels in the entire game. What completely destroys the balance here isn't that you can only see enemies when they're very close to you, it's that whenever Snake or Teleco take damage, their sight is completely disabled for a couple of turns, meaning that if you get hit once, you're going to just continuously get hit and not be able to deal any damage back to the enemies, leading to those softlock scenarios that I mentioned earlier. Once I finally manage to get past this though, Snake and Teleco find a secret entrance to the sewers, hoping that it will get us inside of the far building. But just as we're about to enter, we get a call from our buddy again, telling us that if we go inside the far building, the Hans Davis side of our personality will override the snake part. He tells us to turn back, but then another mysterious voice comes on telling us that we have to enter and destroy Metal Gear to prevent it from being used. Buddy then refers to the other voice as number 16, asking if they think this is all it will take to beat him, saying that they'll never find him, before number 16 responds saying that it was them who summoned him forth this time. 
Teleco asks us if we're okay before Roger calls us, and when Snake asks what the hell just happened on the codec, Roger doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. And at this point, I was starting to wonder if any of this Hans Davis or Number 16 nonsense was actually real, or if Snake was just genuinely losing his mind over the course of the game. Once we enter the sewers, Roger calls Teleco directly, asking if he should really be trusting Snake. He tells her a story from back when he was in Vietnam, where the men in his unit all suspected that there was a spy among them, so to solve the problem, he randomly accused one of his men of being the spy, causing the entire rest of the unit to chase this man down in an attempt to kill him, something that still haunts him to this day. She tells him that she can't really answer that, as his mind is already made up, before we cut back to Senator Hatch again. He reveals to Lena that he hasn't really been losing consciousness, rather he's been pretending to so that he could watch her while she thinks he's not. He's noticed that there's a microphone in the pendant she's wearing, as well as the fact that she wears a gas mask and walks around the plane whenever he goes to sleep, accusing her of being a spy and knowing that the plane would be hijacked before she even got on board. We then cut back to Alice and Manette defusing the bomb, with Alice telling her that the last thing she needs to do to defuse it is to connect the black and white wires together before cutting the red one. Before doing so, Manette says that as long as they've been talking, she can feel that Alice has been holding something in that she's been beating herself up over, saying that whoever she hurt in the past probably doesn't hold it against her the way she thinks they do. Hearing this, Alice then suddenly changes the instructions, saying not to connect the two wires and to only cut the red one, which naturally confuses Manette. And at this point in the game, I had gotten so distracted by the rest of the story that I completely forgot my original suspicion of Alice until now. She obviously changed her instructions to Manette because what she said caused her to change her mind, but the question was whether the new directions would actually defuse the bomb or cause it to instantly explode, which is a pretty tense question to be left hanging on. We cut back to Snake and Teleco, with Alice calling Teleco directly and telling her that Snake's associates have captured Roger, but that she managed to get away. She then explains to her that Snake is actually Hans Davis, and that he was ordered to enter the lab and steal Pythagoras to cover up his and Beagle's involvement, so he slipped back into the Snake side of his personality to be able to do so convincingly. She explains that he plans to steal Metal Gear from Fleming and use it to carry out his plans, and that Teleco needs to be the one to stop him before he's completely consumed by Hans Davis. Teleco then suddenly hears a gunshot over the radio before it cuts out. We move through the basement levels of the far building, eventually coming across Leon, who's been drugged up and completely lost his mind. This leads to a rematch against him, but he's much more difficult this time. The gimmick remains the same, but this time around, he has Accua soldiers backing him up, he has more health than before, and he also now sets up traps using frag grenades. And I swear, every time he threw a grenade, he caught me in the worst possible moments when I had such a high cost that I couldn't run away from them in time and just had to eat the damage. After a couple attempts, we manage to bring him down, but as he's dying, he seemingly snaps back to reality and asks us to give Roger a message from him, asking us to tell him that he said it wasn't me. We move even further down, running into Clown, who's disguised as Teleco again. This leads to a really interesting encounter where we need to figure out which Teleco is the real one, which feels a little awkward as until you figure it out, the real Teleco will actually attack Snake for some reason. And Clown even spawns in some extra Teleco clones by, uh, you know what, the less logic I try to apply to this fight, the better actually. The point is, it's fun. When we kill Clown, they tell us that Fleming is in the hangar below and that he's likely activating Metal Gear as we speak. We get to know her backstory, with her having been in a fire when she was a child, suffering third degree burns. To cover these burns up from the world, she started playing around with makeup from a young age, eventually becoming the master of disguise that she is now. Snake asks why she's helping us, with her saying that villains are supposed to take the hero's side right before they die. Nice to see that even though this was a spin-off, they decided to keep Kojima's signature fourth wall breaks. Teleco grabs Pythagoras off the ground and we move towards the hangar before Teleco confronts us about what Alice said, but she reveals that she believes that we're really solid Snake, saying that we should keep moving further down. And in all honesty, I'm pretty disappointed that they didn't lean into the conflict and distrust between these two a little more. 
it feels like they put this confrontation here just because it wouldn't make sense for her to completely ignore Alice's call. But even having it included here, it feels like Teleco kind of just shrugs her shoulders at it so that the two of them can conveniently still be working together for the final battle. As soon as we get down to Metal Gear though, Hans seemingly takes over Snake, with him telling Fleming that number 16 has given them the perfect opportunity to test Metal Gear. However, he says that Fleming will be the one taking the blame for it, before Fleming asks if we're actually number 16 using Snake to fire Metal Gear. Snake tells him not to worry, as he'll be dead soon anyway, before Teleco draws her gun on us. She tries to shoot at us, but she misses before diving into Metal Gear to escape from us, and Fleming activates Metal Gear in an attempt to stop us. During the activation, we fall off the top of it, hitting our head, bringing Snake back in control of himself before Roger calls in. Snake asks how he's alright, with him saying that he's completely fine and that his codec was just acting up until now. Fleming starts shouting that he knows number 16 better than anyone, saying that he knows about their dream to hide out on a little island in the Pacific. He says that if number 16 doesn't give his daughter back to him now, he'll launch a nuke at that little island before number 16 radios in, saying that his daughter will be dead the second he launches it if he does. And I have to say, this is easily one of the best Metal Gear designs in the franchise so far. Oh, uh, not that one. This one. Yeah, that's the good shit. We get a sort of awkward, but relatively good Metal Gear fight before Teleco finds Fleming inside, telling him not to fire a nuke at the island. He continues to say that none of this is his fault, and that Hans was the one who made him create all of this, before he tries to draw a gun on Teleco, with her quickly shooting him down before he can fire. We get a call from Roger, who tells us that he's sorry, before Alice comes on the line, referring to us as Hans. She says that her plans didn't work out as she thought they would, and that she had thought Snake and Teleco would kill each other by this point. Roger then explains that she was never a psychic, and that she simply knows the facility inside out the way she does because she lived there for a number of years. She then explains that she had thought Snake was really Hans, but that they never actually got to see him face to face because of how cautious he was. She explains that the memories of Hans that we saw throughout the game, as well as the Hans voice that we would hear in our head, were actually planted by her using our implants to dose us up with Accua and put those thoughts in our head. Snake asks why she tried to turn us into Hans, with her explaining that while she's physically number 16, mentally she's number 104. When the experiments were down to just two of them left, 16 plunged a knife into 104's chest, but somehow, 104's consciousness entered 16's body and conquered her mind. She explains that being two people living in one body has been hell for her for years, and so she wants revenge on the Beagle Corporation. Roger then tells us that Roy Campbell was not the one who recommended us for this mission, but that it was in fact Alice, before we hear a gunshot over the radio, and Alice tells us that he tried to grab her gun and she shot him in self-defense. We then cut back to the two dolls on the plane, with it being revealed that Lena has been controlling them the whole time and killing all the passengers, radioing in to Alice to tell her that things have been taken care of. It's then revealed that Minette Donnell was actually Constance, Fleming's daughter, who was also dosed up with Accua and implanted with false memories. We then cut back to Snake and Teleco, with Alice explaining to them that the code being carved into the passengers didn't spell out Snake, but rather Nicole, the name of a large corporation that's been referenced subtly throughout the game. She explains to us that Nicole is a subsidiary of Beagle, and that one of their skincare products wasn't skincare at all, but was actually Accua being sold to the public, before telling us that Accua stands for acting cells under Alice. Because of how widespread Accua became with this, Alice was able to enter the minds of hundreds of thousands of people, implanting them with false memories and illusions in order to control them. She explains that name knowers are people who have a name to go by, which allows her to slip into their mind and control them by whispering to them. Because Solid Snake is only a code name, she gave him the name Hans Davis in an attempt to control him, but unfortunately for her, that plan failed. And among all these revelations, she drops the bomb that the real man who went by Hans Davis was actually Senator Vigo Hatch the entire time, and that he was simply one member of a group that went by Emilio. Snake asks what happened to the planes, with her saying that what Constance said about how number 104 doesn't hate her brought her a lot of relief, so she decided to let the planes go. 
Alice then suddenly yells out in pain before Roger jumps back on the radio, saying that Alice just suddenly grabbed her chest, bit off her tongue, and that she's dead. But then, Roger yells out in pain, with Charles picking up the radio. He tells us that Roger is going to be fine, and that his men are going to treat his bullet wound, with Snake asking what happened to Alice. He tells us that he's not entirely sure, but that it's likely that her mind couldn't handle the amount of information she was getting from everyone under her control, and just collapsed in on itself. Snake asks to speak to Roger again, relaying Leon's message of it wasn't me, with Roger explaining that Leon was the man from his unit that he marked as a traitor all those years ago, saying that it's too late for him to apologize now. And just when it seems like everything's all wrapped up, we cut back to the plane with Constance having stabbed Lena, saying that number 16 barely even caught a glimpse of her back then. She says that number 16 believed that she had taken over her mind, but that she was unable to successfully enter her body, and that her consciousness floated around for a while until coming across Fleming's daughter, who she figured would be the perfect host. She tells Lena that she'll carve the number 104 into her body before we cut to black, getting one more message from a mysterious voice. The voice says to let the public know that Vigo Hatch had been involved in the experiments on Libido Island and was responsible for Metal Gear. They then say that he's not actually a part of Emilio, but he's the perfect one to dump all the blame on. It's then revealed that this voice is Charles, and that he wants Solid Snake, saying that he could mold him into something much greater than number 16 ever was. We get one more cut back to Snake and Teleco, with them talking about what happened before Snake explains that before he was brought in for this mission, he was in the middle of climbing a mountain, and that he was only one day away from being at the top. The two of them decide that they'll go climb the mountain together, and the credits roll. I have to say, I really enjoyed the story here, but I do feel like it all falls apart a bit at the end. It feels like they tried to put too many twists in right at the end, and it just becomes too much for the average person to completely wrap their head around on the first playthrough. I really like a lot of the ideas that they played around with, and I think that the story was super well executed throughout the majority of the game, but dumping the answer to every little plot point from the entire game in one final cutscene is a little too much, and these reveals definitely could have been paced out over the entire last act of the game to make it a lot more digestible. Overall, I enjoyed Metal Gear Acid a good bit. I think that most things in the game are a bit of a mixed bag, as it feels like almost every time they do something really well, they also fumble somewhere else. It's a wild up and down experience from beginning to end, but overall, I definitely found myself enjoying it for the majority of my time spent with it. It's probably a bit of a hard recommendation for most Metal Gear fans, as if you aren't already a fan of turn-based strategy games, this definitely won't be the one to change your mind, but if any of the things that I talked about in this video seem interesting to you, you should definitely give it a shot when you get the chance. There's a lot of game here too, with the game taking me about 21 hours on a first playthrough, and with there still being plenty of cards for me to go back and collect and experiment with if I ever get the urge to. So at the end of the day, I'm going to give Metal Gear Acid a 7.5. Hey guys, thanks for swinging by. I've been enjoying the hell out of producing the series, and interacting with you guys has made it more than worth the effort. If you get into full series retrospectives like this, check out these playlists on screen. And if you like what you see, maybe check out my Patreon page to help keep the channel alive and kicking. Well, thanks guys, and I'll hope to see all of you right here for the next Metal Gear review.